on this Saturday night, an Indigenous man shot and killed by RCMP. Why the Mounties in New Brunswick say they had no choice. They were confronted by a man who had knives. And why a police watchdog from another province is now investigating. It's New Brunswick's second police-involved death of an Indigenous person this month. How can we ever trust any police force? Tonight, the memorial march for Chantelle Moore. Plus, the backlash facing Donald Trump as he tries to rally support for his re-election campaign. And remembering the rapture of the Raptors' victory one year ago. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin in New Brunswick where for the second time this month, police have shot and killed an Indigenous person. It started last night when RCMP responded to a call about a disturbed person near the city of Miramichi, northeast of Fredericton. Tonight, Quebec's police watchdog is investigating what led to the man's death. Global's Callum Smith has the story. It's just heartbreaking. It's devastating. Family members are searching for answers after New Brunswick RCMP fatally shot an indigenous man Friday night. Police say they were called to this home in the community of Boom Road, about half hour from Miramichi, for a report of an unwanted person. Uh, when members arrived on scene, they were confronted by a man who had knives um, and uh, lunged at, at the members. Uh, energy weapon was deployed and it was unsuccessful, and an RCMP member, um, member discharged a firearm. 48-year-old Rodney Levi was taken to hospital where he later died. The family says he had mental health and drug addiction concerns with crystal meth, but wasn't able to get treatment. If he would have got the help that he needed, maybe this, we wouldn't be here today, you know. We wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be here today. Rodney would have been scared because he thought the police were really wanting to kill him. He told several people that day, the police are going to kill me, which was not, ha not that's not what was happening. He just, his drug-induced psychosis, that's what he thought and felt and 100% believed. Family says he was going to visit a local pastor to help him heal, but that someone at the home who might not have known him may have called the police. Levi's niece says he loved her kids and was a pleasure to be around. It's a sin because he's the most beautiful person you could ever meet. He was so kind, gentle. He loved, he was, he just loved everybody. He was the most generous human being I've ever met. But the second fatal police-involved shooting of an Indigenous person in New Brunswick in the last two weeks is a pain this family can't comprehend, leaving them searching for answers as Quebec's police watchdog investigates RCMP's actions. Callum Smith, Global News. The government in New Brunswick has launched a coroner's inquest into the death of Chantel Moore. The Indigenous woman was shot and killed by police in New Brunswick who were asked to check in on her well-being. And tonight there are calls for a bigger review. Hundreds of people, including her family, gathered for healing marches today, demanding a full public inquiry into the province's policing and justice system. As Silas Brown reports, today's walk was mostly silent but the message was loud. They walked in silence through the streets of the Madawaska Maliseet First Nation into Edmonston, slowly to try and heal the pain caused by loss. It's almost as if our ancestors from below that we've buried were lifting us up to tell us not to give up, and that's what was going through my mind. At the head, Martha Martin whose daughter Chantel Moore was shot and killed by Edmonston police during a wellness check on June 4th. We shouldn't have to be afraid of having that wellness call. You know, the message today is, you know, we're going to come together as one and, and that's really important. Martin was joined by a dozen family members who came from British Columbia for Moore's funeral. The walk ended in Edmonston's town square, where family spoke to the crowd. We've been hurt many times. How can we ever trust any police force? Why should we even answer the door for a wellness check? How in the hell did that happen? Moore leaves behind a young daughter. 
Her great aunt Nora Martin spoke at the end of the walk about how Indigenous children shouldn't have to grow up without mothers. Yesterday we were invited to the Toby community and on our way there she kept talking about her mother and she said I don't want to die like my mother. In the wake of Moore's death calls for an inquiry into systemic racism in New Brunswick have grown louder but Saturday's walk was about healing and to allow the family a chance to cry once again for justice for their daughter. Silas Brown, Global News, Edmonston, New Brunswick. There have been several violent confrontations involving Indigenous Canadians and police. This week on the West Block, Mercedes Stevenson opens up a dialogue with some prominent advocates for Canada's First Nations communities. Mercedes. Robin, in recent days, there's been a change in the conversations that many Canadians are having. As a country, we're talking about systemic racism, what it means, where it is found, and the negative impact it has on our society, as well as how we can address it and move forward. Cindy Blackstock is a very well-known and respected advocate for Indigenous children. I asked her to explain what exactly we're talking about when people refer to systemic racism in Canada. Well, what systemic racism means to me is when treating people differently because of a particular trait becomes normalized in society and in some ways even made benevolent. We think about residential schools, the removal of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children from their families because the assumption was it was better for the kids because these parents could take care of them. And even now we have the federal government who at the same time while they're admonishing systemic racism in police forces and other institutions are actually perpetrating racial discrimination against 165,000 children. That's not a matter of opinion, it's a matter of court order. And as recently as September of 2019, they were found that that discrimination was resulting in unnecessary family separations and the deaths of some children. So they can stand there and say that they're against it while they perpetrate it at the same time. Systemic racism in the RCMP has been a controversial subject over the past week since a video emerged of the arrest of Chief Alan Adam in Alberta over an expired license plate. RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky said she's struggling to understand the term systemic racism, but she did believe unconscious bias exists in the force. I asked National Chief Perry Bellegarde what he thought of the commissioner's comments. I recall a few years back, former Commissioner Bob Paulson came to our Chiefs and Assembly and clearly stated, and he had the courage, he had the courage in front of the Chiefs of Canada to say, there is racism in the RCMP and we need to deal with it and need to fix it. And he wanted to get the racists out of the RCMP. So that was four or five years back. I don't believe that it has been fixed at all. So we have a lot of work to do now. And I go back to my earlier point. It's there. We don't need to question whether or not there is racism or systemic racism or the, the excessive use of force, it's there. Let's put our energy, how do we fix it to make sure that our people don't get hurt or killed at the hands of the RCMP anymore. We'll have more on the show about racism in Canada, the concern about systemic racism in policing, and in particular the RCMP, and what needs to change in our country going forward. Robin. Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. And you can see the extended interviews on the West Block with Mercedes Stevenson tomorrow. Some breaking news tonight. Atlanta's police chief has resigned after members of her police force fatally shot a black man Friday night. 27-year-old Rayshard Brooks was sleeping in a vehicle in a Wendy's parking lot. When police tried to arrest him, a struggle ensued and he tried to run away. He was then shot. Atlanta's mayor, who announced the news late today, says she does not believe the shooting was a justified use of deadly force. While there may be debate as to whether this was an appropriate use of deadly force, I firmly believe that there is a clear distinction between what you can do and what you should do. One of the officers reportedly pulled out a taser during the struggle, which the man ended up taking and tried to fire at officers before he was shot as he fled. He was taken to a hospital where he died after surgery. The two officers involved have been removed from duty pending a further investigation. Anti-racism rallies are taking place around the world again this weekend. In London, police formed barriers between supporters of Black Lives Matter and far-right protesters in Trafalgar Square. In the middle of it, flares and smoke bombs were tossed into the crowd. 
It was a similar scene in Paris where anti-racism protesters clashed with counter demonstrators. At one point, a small group of far-right activists climbed a building and unfurled a giant banner that read, White Lives Matter. The U.S. president is bowing to public pressure and rescheduling a campaign rally that was set for Juneteenth. That's the day to commemorate the end of slavery in America. But the criticism wasn't enough to force Trump to reschedule a controversial speech today. Jennifer Johnson explains. With cadet social distancing, U.S. President Donald Trump addressed more than a thousand graduates of West Point Military Academy in New York. I want to take this opportunity to thank all members of America's armed forces who stepped forward to help battle the invisible enemy, the new virus that came to our shores from a distant land called China. Trump's speech comes during a contentious time in his relationship with military leaders. A number of them, including Defense Secretary Mark Esper and Joint Chiefs Chairman General Mark Milley, have accused the president of politicizing the military when he suggested using soldiers against protesters in the wake of George Floyd's death, but he did not address that. Meanwhile, the president is set to go back on the campaign trail next week. Late Friday, he reversed course, changing the date of his campaign kickoff rally in Tulsa from June 19th to June 20th. Tulsa has a long history of racial tensions, and the 19th is known as Juneteenth, when African Americans mark the end of slavery. Think about it as a celebration. The president has several upcoming rallies as cases of COVID-19 continue to rise in at least 14 states. We've already uncorked the genie. We got our wish, which was to end the home quarantine orders. And now we're seeing people treat that as if COVID-19 is no longer an issue. And that's far from the fact. The CDC continues to encourage people to avoid large gatherings and wear a mask, something many Trump supporters failed to do at a packed church in Dallas Thursday, drawing criticism. I was angry because that's our commander in chief. That's the person who's supposed to be leading the effort to keep you alive in the time of COVID. But with his job on the line and forced to take a three month hiatus, the president is anxious to ignite his supporters. Meanwhile, his White House Coronavirus Task Force hasn't addressed the American public for over seven weeks. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. After the United States, Brazil now has the second highest death toll from COVID-19. Critics are calling out President Jair Bolsonaro for exacerbating the health pandemic by reopening the country too soon. More than 41,000 people have died from COVID-19 in Brazil, and there are more than 828,000 cases in the country. A district in Beijing is under a wartime emergency after a new cluster of COVID-19 was traced back to the largest meat and vegetable market in the city center. There are fears that may fuel a second wave in China's densely populated capital. Coming up, the controversial psychedelic treatment making a medical comeback. In the 50s, Canadian researchers were considered world leaders in the use of psychedelics to treat mental health issues. But in the 60s, you couldn't mention these drugs without thinking of hippies. Today, there's a second wave of this controversial treatment, and it's showing promise. Mike Trelay reports. It's meant to mimic a sensory deprivation tank, blindfold headphones, and as you sit back in the zero-gravity chair, the psychedelic effects of ketamine take hold. Tune in and drop out. In the 1960s, recreational LSD pioneer Timothy Leary spurred an entire generation to embrace cultural change through psychedelics. And while the counterculture movement got high, the U.S. and Canadian governments weren't feeling the same buzz. All research into the clinical benefits of psychedelics ceased, and the drugs went further underground. That is, until recent years, when scientists began looking for alternatives to antidepressants. The need exists because there are so many people struggling with depression and anxiety and other mental health conditions. MDMA, known on the street as ecstasy or molly, has shown promise in treating PTSD, as have clinical trials looking at psilocybin or magic mushrooms to treat depression. The only psychedelic legal for medicinal use in Canada, ketamine, is the primary drug being used at Toronto's field trip, the first psychedelic enhanced therapy clinic in Canada, aimed at patients for whom antidepressants have stopped working. Unlike pills like Prozac, which are taken daily, the psychedelic model involves multiple sessions where patients are dosed 
and then treated. The current model is, um, you know, we're going to give you pharmaceuticals, they're going to numb your experiences. So we're going to just numb your sadness. We're going to also simultaneously numb your joy. And what we're trying to do is rewire the brain in a healthy way. And you need a therapist guiding you to do that. Canadians are among the highest consumers of antidepressants in the world, trailing only the US, Iceland, and Australia. But antidepressants, because of their side effects, are as controversial as they are popular, which in turn has fueled interest in largely unproven psychedelics. We have almost no long-term research. So just because you feel incredible, you know, right after a trip or even a week after a trip doesn't tell us anything about what's going to happen to you in six months, a year or, or longer. Canadian researchers in the 50s were digging for those answers. Almost seven decades later, the one in 10 Canadians who rely on antidepressants are hoping today's doctors find what they were looking for. Mike Drelake, Global News, Toronto. Still ahead, wearing the badge as a black woman. Stacey Clark has been a member of the Toronto Police Service for more than two decades. She's one of only five black female police inspectors in all of Canada. And as Karen Lieberman explains, she has a unique perspective on what's happening in the world right now. And a warning, this story contains disturbing footage. I was angry, uh, I was frustrated all at the same time uh, because I really, in that moment, um, I, I heard the cry for his mother. I heard the, I can't breathe. 22 years of policing, of building partnerships to try and bridge the gap between the black community and Toronto Police Service, of rising through the ranks to become one of five black female inspectors in Canada, and then the cries heard around the world by George Floyd. You know, you're trying so hard to instill a certain trust and, and then in nine minutes, it's gone. Sparking a movement demanding change. I can't breathe! I recognized that the statements that were being made were statements at my uniform and the system and some of the systemic racism that exists. Inspector Stacy Clark balances the duties of the police uniform with those of a proud member of the black community. On top of that, she's raising a daughter and a son with whom she has very candid conversations. How do you talk to a police officer? What do you say to a police officer? Um, it just, it's second nature for him. He's like 11, you know, it's really, it's second nature for him. And it's what mommy does. I have to just prepare them how to handle it. That ended up being my answer all week. I have to prepare them for how to handle it because I know they will have to. So. There is no denying, she says, that systemic racism exists in this country on many levels. Anti-black racism is real. Systemic racism is real. And it is here. And it is not just in policing institutions. Um, it's in our education institutions and, quite frankly, in our health institutions. Clark says despite calls to defund the police, she sees a role for law enforcement in Canada, but would like to see communities be a part of recreating the systems that treat people unfairly. This can't be just a black police officer um, to fix this. This can't be a black community to fix this. Everyone has an equal part and an equal role in this. And this, she says, is how it starts. You do all that you can to be the person that removes uh, the knee off of George Floyd's neck. You need to be that person to remove that knee. Karen Lieberman, Global News, Toronto. Up next, Basketball Diaries, the game that made NBA history in Canada. Muted celebrations mark the Queen's official birthday in Britain. But the bans on large gatherings because of COVID-19 forced the royals to break from tradition. Instead of a large parade known as the Trooping the Colour, soldiers gave a private performance. It's the first time Queen Elizabeth, who turned 94 in April, has appeared in public since Britain's lockdown. Remember the energy from the Toronto Raptors NBA championship win? Well, that was one year ago. And tonight, Global News will air a special at 7 p.m. to relive that magical moment. The Raptors had a shot at doing it all again this year, but the season stalled because of COVID-19. The NBA schedule starts again this summer. And as Anthony Bruno reports, 
Fans are once again on the edge of their seats. 24 seasons in the making. One big trophy and one even bigger party. It's right, it's right. It was a victory for Canada. Fans gathering from coast to coast celebrating the Raptors' first NBA championship. Everyone just kind of emerged and everyone sort of knew where to go and, and just seeing the, the sort of energy in the streets and everyone was celebrating, honking horns, waving flags, just sort of the, the vibe was very good. This is poetic. This is poetic. You just got to watch it happen. The six and six, we did this. We did this off a of heart. We did this off of love. 44% of the nation's population tuned in for at least some of the championship winning game. It was a defining moment for Canadian sports. The team's momentum continued into this season despite the loss of star player Kawhi Leonard. The Raptors were sitting in second place in the Eastern Conference when COVID-19 halted hopes for a repeat. They're still well positioned to be solid and it's, it's obviously unfortunate that the season has been so up in the air because they could have beaten anyone in the playoffs. Hope has reignited with news the NBA will return this summer, playing all games at Disney World in Orlando. The feeling will be much different, though. There won't be fans in the stands or outside packing Jurassic Park like we saw one year ago, but after capturing the hearts of fans across the country, you can bet everyone will be watching once again, cheering on the Raptors as they attempt to defend their championship. As for another parade this year, well, if the Raptors pull off the repeat, Canada is going to have to get creative with its celebration this time around. Anthony Bruno, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Saturday. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is a beautiful sunset in Birchie Bay, Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you for watching and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Good night.